So what is a hero? The Cambridge Dictionary defines a hero as a person admired for bravery, great achievements, or good qualities. Now focusing it and expanding on the question in My Hero Academia, what is a hero? In episode 24, in the aftermath of Deku's defeat at the hands of Todoroki during the sports festival arc, All Might consoles a dejected Deku by telling him that meddling when you don't need to is the essence of being a hero. An interesting insight into the quality that forms the core or essence of what makes a hero in the mind of All Might, but it doesn't really answer the question of what makes a hero in this world. If we take the first definition again that a hero is someone admired for bravery, great achievements, or good qualities, then to many it's undeniable that All Might is a hero. However, when we expand our gaze outwards and take stock of the entire heroic populace and the rules which govern that group in this series, things are not that straightforward. Is a person admired for their bravery still a hero if they don't possess a quirk? Is a person with a powerful quirk and who is admired for their bravery still a hero if they don't possess a hero license? Is a hero still a hero if they don't wear a costume, have a hero's name, or receive financial compensation for their acts of heroism? What about an individual who commits acts of cruelty and abuse in their private lives? Are they a hero if they are officially recognized by the state and receive financial rewards for their acts of heroism in the public eye? The question of being a hero in the society depicted in the series is pretty complex the deeper we dive into it. Being a person admired for bravery, great achievements or good qualities is never truly enough to be called a hero, just as meddling when you don't need to is not enough either. No matter how heroic the deed or how selfless the action being undertaken is, in this society that action in and of itself is never truly heroic. In fact, in the eyes of the law and the state, those great achievements, those heroic deeds can and would be, if you don't hold a license, regarded as the opposite of heroic. They're villainous. In chapter 12 of the My Hero Academia spin-off Vigilantes, we learn that prior to the implementation of the hero licensing system, there were quite a few people using their quirks to fight crime. These crime fighters numbered 189 in the state of Rhode Island alone, and the state of Rhode Island would later become the first place to implement the hero licensing system. Of those 189 crime fighters, known as vigilantes, only seven would receive the required accreditation to become pro-heroes, while a large percentage of the remaining 182 vigilantes were classified as villains, while never perpetrating any acts which would be deemed as explicitly villainous, but rather for illegally using their quirks without licenses. In the words of Makoto from the Vigilante series, the true goal of the licensing system was not to endorse heroes, but define what constitutes a villain, to divide those arbitrarily using their quirks into heroes and villains, and to put limitations on the latter. Just part of the plan to regulate quirks on a societal level. This conflict also made it into the second season of the anime in the wake of the battle with Stain. We witnessed Ida, Todoroki and Deku all receive a verbal warning from Tsurigame for using their quirks to fight crime without the presence of their supervisors or being fully licensed. In just a handful of generations, quirks had become normative and quirk regulation, the norm. But how is this achieved? The French philosopher Louis Althusser would suggest that it is through a network of seemingly apolitical institutions called ideological state apparatuses, or ISAs. These ISAs are a series of entities that express and impose order through disseminating ideologies that reinforce the control of the state. Althusser contends that the state cannot hold power unless it exercises domination over and through ISAs. Through ISAs like the UA Academy, the media, pro-hero agencies, etc., a heroic ideology begins to take root throughout the society, and a self-legitimizing narrative of the professional hero becomes the accepted social consensus pertaining to heroes. This narrative becomes one that at once both controls the populace through quirk regulation and enforces the repressive ideology of the state. Through the normalization, standardization, and monetization of the hero and heroic action, a gap has emerged between the signified or mental concept of the hero and its signifier, the pro-hero. This society requires something in order to fill that gap. You need to be a pro, and what has taken root is the commodification of heroic action. Heroism is no longer an act of sacrificial altruism for the betterment or preservation of the helpless other. Now it has been assigned a monetary value. We see the effects of this everywhere throughout the series. Take for example Deku's bedroom. It is at once a shrine to his idol All Might, and a glaring example of the industry which has grown up around the industry of the pro hero. There are mugs, pencil holders, posters, action figures, curtains, etc. And they all serve as testament to the money-making machine, which is the brand of the number one hero, the heroic paragon and empirical proof that the system works, all might. We see it elsewhere too in Endeavor's obsession with the hero ranking system or the pro snake hero Uwabami and her apparent obsession with celebrity throughout the hero killer arc. The term hero has become inextricably linked to the word pro and this radically alters how society understands heroes on a connotative level. Society no longer needs to tell you what a hero is, it's become a matter of course. It's become fact. 
the pro hero as a package. They need the costume, the alias, the correct paperwork, a ranking, and a personality that tells the world, I am a pro hero. A pro hero needs all of these things. Otherwise, are they ever really a hero? The sad truth of it all is that of all of these connotations that inform what a hero is, none of them have anything to do with your character or the actions you've taken, and instead have everything to do with the social reality in which you exist. This is the heroic ideology at the heart of My Hero Academia, and it exists at the level of environmental realities. It's common sense. It's obvious. And yet, standing at the top of it all is All Might. A pro hero with real character. A pro hero admired for bravery. Great achievements are good qualities. A pro hero who lives by the code of meddling when you don't need to. And a hero coronated by society as a symbol of peace. All Might is everything that a pro hero should, or at the very least, aspire to be. He is the heroic ideal which gives legitimacy to the whole hero system. He is what makes it run as smoothly as it does. And his unwavering presence at the summit of hero society allows for the continual propagation of the system, as he has become in a symbolic sense the embodiment of the system. The perception is that we don't need to question the system because we don't need to question All Might. The system is absolute because All Might is absolute. He is the heroic ideal that can never be measured up to. He is the summit of a mountain that can never be scaled, and though all try, none are truly equal. His quasi-mystical status in the society keeps the gears of the industry moving. It becomes almost instinctual that heroes like Endeavor want to surpass him. Children like Deku want to be like him, and villains like Kirogiri need to defeat him. That is why the truth of All Might's ailing health must be covered up at all costs. It is not solely to prevent villains from becoming emboldened, it's to preserve the sovereignty of the hero system. As long as the aura of All Might remains intact, everyone plays the role they were determined by the system to play, and the gears of the hero industry keep turning. The whole hero system is driven by this unattainable sense of desire. This desire to measure up to, to surpass, to succeed, or to defeat All Might. As the philosopher for Ernest Becker explained, in each of us subconsciously, there is a desire for transcendence, a desire to be a hero and to be remembered. If we achieve this, then in some sense we can transcend death through that remembrance. This desire is, at its core, unattainable, as no hero can ever truly measure up to all might, but still that desire remains. Now, rather than give up in despair at the folly that is this unattainable goal, Becker hypothesized that the individual's desire is redirected back into hero society through cultural hero systems. Cultural hero systems Systems are the avenues that culture allows for making a secure contribution to the world despite the realization that this contribution is a finite one. For example, Endeavor, he can never truly replace the symbolic significance All Might holds within society, but the hero ranking system gives him the drive to continually work towards that end. It allows all heroes to continually strive to move up the ranking system. The hero can continue to fight crime and work within the system because it keeps the fantasy alive that each villain I defeat, each crime that I prevent, allows me to climb up the ladder and continue to chase All Might. It is the fantasies that these cultural hero systems enable which prevent the collapse of the pro hero system. And allows the state to continue to control and profit from quirks and quirk usage by allowing the system to continue to reinforce the importance of the pro in pro hero and is the heart of the existential crisis which will arise within society as we transition into the second and third season of My Hero Academia when the symbol of peace and societal stability is forced to retire. If you guys made it this far and you liked the video, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like or even subscribing. It would be greatly appreciated if you would like to go that extra mile. Share this video so that other people who are interested can see it also. I'd like to thank my editor for this project, Mia. Her details are in the description below. And as always, if you're interested in hearing where all of these ideas come from, please check out my podcast. The link is in the description below.